were told we're going to flatten the curve to let our healthcare systems quiet down and then we'll open things up. It's been I kind of lost track. 52 days now, 53 days, I can't remember. Enough is enough. Our liberties are being infringed upon. I get the idea of safety, but more important than safety is our individual rights and our individual liberty. And that's being stepped on right now. And that's where I have the problem. When it comes to flattening the curve, how much of that was because people stayed inside and followed the guidelines compared to maybe what the reality of the virus is? So the reality is we don't know, of course. So there are some argue, had we not flattened the curve, there'd be millions of people dead. Okay, I get that. Unlikely, but I get that. And we have examples where that so you are a doctor? Board certified family practice. I've been doing this for about 30 years in private practice here in Southern California. As a doctor, what's some of the more frustrating things you're seeing when it comes to how coronavirus is being represented by the media and kind of how the public's perceiving it? Well, I think most importantly is that the perspective that I have, that I've put out there, that many of your um, viewers have seen, is not being put out there. So anytime there's a narrative that isn't right in line with the mainstream narrative, it's either not shown, it's banned or blocked or viciously attacked. And that's really the problem I have. It's not so much that my perspective is right, although I think it is, it's that I'm attacked for having a different position. And I don't mean my ideas are attacked. I mean me personally am attacked, that I should lose my license, uh, that uh, you know, a few people have said on social media, they hope I get the virus and die so my voice is no longer heard, that I'm being irresponsible, that somebody should call the medical board, my local hospital, and so forth. So it's not about saying my perspective is incorrect and attacking my viewpoint, but it's attacking me personally and then bringing in my family as well to that, which I think is just ridiculous. What were some of the opinions you had that differed from the mainstream narrative? The lockdown that we're in the midst of, we're in Orange County now, and our governor here in California has basically shut down the state. The original narrative was we need to flatten the curve. And that made some sense when we had healthcare systems that were being overwhelmed in New York, in New Jersey, for a time in Seattle. So it made a lot of sense. If our healthcare systems were being overwhelmed, we wanna keep people at home so we're not getting more cases because there's no more room at the end, if you will. But now across the country, including here in Orange County in California, our healthcare systems have plenty of capacity. And the policies that are in place right now are injuring people. They're, they're killing people. So for example, we got a report up from uh, Ontario, Canada, that 30 people while awaiting cardiac surgery died. They were waiting because their surgery was deemed non-essential. I have patients that need surgery, joint replacement surgery, for example, things that are causing them a lot of disability and pain, yet they're being told that they're not essential, so they need to continue to take their narcotics. They need to continue to have their joints be even more worn out and be in a lot of pain. And so the policies that we have in place right now are really harming people. Suicide rate is the highest we've seen it since the Great Depression. We have over 30 million Americans that have purposely been, been put on un unemployment because of the economic shutdown. Drug abuse is high, spousal abuse, child abuse, domestic violence, mental health problems. Our own local sheriff, uh, Don Barnes, has reported that our 911 system is being overwhelmed by domestic violence calls. So the policies initially were tolerable and they made sense logically, quiet the cases down, our healthcare systems are being overwhelmed, but now we're creating government dependency like we've never seen before because of the unemployment, and that's the message that's not getting out. The message that is getting out is the mainstream narrative. The government is here to, uh, to, to keep you safe. We know best from a government standpoint. Individual liberty, individual risk assessment be damned that we know what's right for you and you stay inside. Can't use the beaches, public parks are closed. And some of these things are quite arbitrary and capricious. So for example, here in California, we're told felons need to be let out of jail because they're being exposed to COVID virus. But at the same time, individual citizens are not allowed to exercise their second amendment right by going to a gun store to purchase a firearm because 
because gun stores are closed down. Essential businesses are marijuana dispensaries. Essential businesses are liquor stores. Non-essential, if you wanna to go to church on a Sunday, you're not allowed to do that, even with social distancing. So we've got our priorities backwards, and some of these restrictions seem quite arbitrary. They don't make sense, and I think they're an overstep of our constitutional rights. I don't wanna give motives to the politicians that are working hard, and I think they legitimately are trying to do what they think is in their best interest. Um, but when, when some of these um, decisions are made and they appear quite arbitrary, you almost wonder if there's some political gain that is being looked at to be had, especially during an election year. I've heard a lot of politicians and media pundits say that this may be um, you know, President Trump's Katrina, if you will, that they almost, they almost, it almost feels like they're rooting for this virus to cause President Trump not to be reelected. And there's this political divide that is just completely unnecessary. Healthcare is not politics, and it shouldn't be about politics. It should be about what is the, in the best interest of the country, what is in the best interest of individuals, and balance that with our constitutional rights. And unfortunately, I just don't think that's being done. Gavin Newsom just signed an executive order that makes California a vote by mail state giving all the citizens uh, mail-in ballots. Do you think voting booths are unsafe during this coronavirus pandemic? So we're good waiting in line to go to Costco or go to Walmart, but we're not okay waiting in line to go cast a ballot. Our fundamental constitutional rights of voting. So it's too dangerous for us to do that but it's not too dangerous for us to go to a marijuana dispensary, a liquor store, or Costco. You know, I'm not saying that, that Governor Newsom has purposely done this from the standpoint of trying to alter an election. I don't wanna believe that. Boy, I just don't wanna believe that. I just think he's making decisions in a vacuum without a clear perspective and differences of opinion for him to make that decision, but it just doesn't seem right. When we can't wait in line to vote, but we can wait in line to go to a marijuana dispensary or a Costco or a liquor store or you name it. When elective surgeries are deemed uh, inaccessible, but elective abortions are considered to be okay, that doesn't make sense to me. There's no consistency, and these decisions just are being made, in my opinion, in a capricious and arbitrary way. Have you treated patients with COVID-19? Multiple. Um, what were the experiences you had there? So my patients have all had mild symptoms or have tested positive but didn't have symptoms. I've spoken to doctors, a lot of them, that have treated COVID-19 patients. And especially early on, the treatment protocols are pretty straightforward. But again, now we've made treatment of COVID-19 a political issue. So hydroxychloroquine, for example, is found to be very safe, effective, cheap, uh, and readily available now, yet to prescribe it, like nothing else that I've ever done. We routinely as physicians prescribe medications off-label all the time. That's just what we do. We use our best judgment and clinical experience and we use medications that maybe it wasn't approved for initially by the FDA, but we found to be effective so we use it, common practice. But if I use hydroxychloroquine now and I write a prescription, not uncommonly I'll get a phone call from the pharmacy for me to justify why I'm prescribing this medication. I've never had this happen in my 30 plus year, so years career. You write all kinds of prescriptions, you never had someone really question and come back? Never, nope, never. But now every time I write it, I get a response back to justify why. Either the patient is sick and they meet a certain protocol, they're of a particular age or this, that, and the other. I've never seen that before. And I know, I know that this, this drug is being used throughout the country successfully and safely um, yet it's now a political drug because a few months ago, can't remember how long ago now, every day just seems like you know a year, but a, maybe a month and a half ago, President Trump said on public TV, I remember I was driving to work, listening to the news, one of the press conferences, and I heard him say it, and immediately when I heard him say something about hydroxychloroquine, I said, oh boy, here we go, how long is it gonna be? Since till my phone blows up, till I start getting emails from patients, and sure enough, by the time I got to the office, I had already received emails inquiring about hydroxychloroquine. But now immediately the press picked it up, and now hydroxychloroquine is a political drug. So if there's a study that shows that it doesn't work, 
mainstream media front page news. If there's a study that shows that it has some benefit, it's ignored or when it's presented, right next to it is a so-called expert to immediately shoot down that study uh, to say that this is not a good drug to be using despite the fact that it's being used all over the country very successfully and very safely. What people don't realize is hydroxychloroquine has been around since the, since the late 1950s and it was primarily used to treat malaria. Hundreds of thousands of people take it every day for a variety of autoimmune diseases such as um, rheumatoid arthritis and systemic lupus and they use it safely and it's very effective. Yet I'm told that a similar dose for a seven day course is somehow dangerous and that I shouldn't be using it. And I think that's ridiculous. Now maybe it's not as effective as some of us believe, I get that, but my right as a physician to make in my judgment what is best for my patient at the moment in consultation with proper um, information to that patient about the risks and benefits, um, now that's being blocked or at least inhibited, and I don't think that's right. And hydroxychloroquine works in your experience? My experience, it works. Not only works to treat mild disease when mixed with um, uh, a ZPAC or zithromycin and zinc, but also can be effective in preventing disease. So if you have an older person that's been exposed but hasn't caught the virus, um, I've seen studies and I have experience in treating that person to prevent them from converting and prevent them from getting ill. And there are a lot of people who are grabbing onto this idea that if all this shutdown and everything saves just one life, then it'll be worth it. Yes. But what's the things that they're missing? What else is going on behind the scenes that we're not really aware of? You know, that's a great question. And I, and I resonate with that. If we can only save one lives, better safe than sorry. As a matter of fact, I wrote a piece with that title, Better Safe Than Sorry? Question mark it was published in uh, 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 The American Thinker. And the issue is we're not better safe than sorry because the sorry part is happening right now. So the sorry part is 30 million more, 30 million plus people that are unemployed and now dependent upon government. The sorry part now is the highest suicide rate that we've seen. So we may save one person who doesn't get coronavirus, but the other person who now is depressed and can't feed their family, uh, can't pay the rent, um, and literally is committing suicide, that's a problem. Delayed surgeries, we don't even know the consequences of that. So we have people that are dying because of delayed surgery, that are being permanently affected, their condition because their surgeries have been delayed now, one month, two months, sometimes longer, and worse. Not to mention one case of child abuse because of um, the quarantine or domestic violence, one case, that's a case that's gonna live with that person the rest of their lives. And so it shouldn't be taken lightly. Well, I don't wanna die of coronavirus, um, so let's just stay quarantined. Um, you can always fix an economic problem, but a death from coronavirus you can never fix. I get that narrative, but at some point we need to realize that the continued lockdown is gonna have consequences beyond what we could ever imagine. I mean, this is great depression level unemployment, and we turn the switch back on to turn the economy, a lot of these unemployed people are not going back to work because their jobs no longer exist. Small businesses, restaurants, even large businesses. I heard Neiman Marcus is finally shuttering up. They are going out of business because they were on the brink and this just put them over the edge. And there's other businesses like that. So these are thousands and thousands of workers that are not gonna have jobs to come back to. Um, so it's not just a temporary unemployment. We're creating a permanent or at least long lasting unemployment uh, class. Here's my belief, listen. We have rules in this country, we have, the, we have a constitution that is supposed to restrain the government and provide maximum liberty. I believe in people more than I believe in the government, and I believe in individual liberty and risk assessment. So I wanna give each individual their own opportunity to make a decision as to what's best for their life with information. And if they choose that they wanna open up their business with proper precautions, by, and keeping the, at the highest at risk safe, then I think we should allow that to happen, especially if we're in a situation where our healthcare systems are not being overwhelmed. And that's the way it is across the country. We were told we're gonna flatten the curve to let our healthcare systems quiet down and then we'll open things up. 
It's been, I kind of lost track, 52 days now, 53 days, I can't remember. Enough is enough. Our liberties are being infringed upon. I get the idea of safety, but more important than safety is our individual rights and our individual liberty. And, and that's being stepped on right now. And that's where I have the problem. When it comes to flattening the curve, how much of that was because people stayed inside and followed the guidelines compared to maybe what the reality of the virus is? So the reality is we don't know, of course. So there are some argue, had we not flattened the curve, there'd be millions of people dead. O okay, I get that. Unlikely, but I get that. And we have examples where that actually didn't happen. When you look at Sweden, when you look at South Korea, when you look at Thailand and other countries where they didn't have the draconian lockdowns like we have here. So it's possible that there would be more people killed as a result of this virus. But it's also possible that we would have reached herd immunity quicker and we'd see this virus now quieting down like we've seen with other respiratory viruses in the past. And there are some prominent epidemiologists and virologists that have put this message forward. But what happens? They're banned on YouTube. Facebook blocks them. The mainstream narr narrative, the mainstream media never gives them any airtime except to criticize them. Here's Dr. So-and-so who says the following. Then they have their own expert that says, no way, they're, they're fraud. And, and by the way, you know, did you know that they got a speeding ticket a few months ago or something of that sort? So there's this narrative that's going forward and I'm not sure why. I don't wanna believe malintent from a motive standpoint, but it's hard not to believe that some on the left in the mainstream media really hope that we can continue this on long enough to unelect our president. And I'm sorry to say that, but I think there's some, there's some truth to that. I don't wanna believe that politicians and decision makers have that perspective, but I think some of them lean in that direction where they're not entirely disappointed that this, this mainstream scare is going on uh, to the extent that it, helped, that it, that it hurts uh, President Trump. I've heard that some doctors are over attributing COVID-19 as the cause of death with a lot of their patients. Are doctors motivated to get as many COVID-19 patients as possible so they can receive federal funds? So I don't wanna say they're motivated to, but there are incentives in place and the incentives are based on good motives, meaning that if a hospital system is overwhelmed because we're treating patients with this virus, then we're gonna reimburse them at a higher rate to make up for some of the work and difficulty and trauma that they've been experiencing by taking care of these patients. So there are mechanisms in place to reimburse hospitals, but the only way they can track that is by tracking the number of COVID-19 patients and the number of deaths that are associated with COVID-19 patients. So what we do see is happening is, um, is patients that die, but without a laboratory diagnosis, they're getting coded COVID-19. And there's this natural human tendency to lean in the direction of something that is economically benefiting their healthcare system. When I code um, uh, on our electronic medical record systems, there are coding for COVID-19 and uh, the, 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 the organizations that provide these codings, um, you know, let us know what the, what the, what the cost and benefit is for, for making these codes. So I don't wanna say there's dishonest doctors out there that are doing this purposely. I'm sure there's some of that, but there's this natural tendency to lean in the direction and code in a way that will ensure higher reimbursements for a healthcare system that's overwhelmed. So like every COVID death Every COVID death a person had COVID, not every COVID death is from COVID. Correct, that's right. So going forward with all of this, what would your plan of action be if you were in charge? I'm still waiting for the phone call from Governor Newsom. Uh, hasn't come yet, um, but if I were in charge, I'd look individually at the local healthcare systems. I would put as much decision-making power into the hands of the local politicians, city of Newport Beach, the city of Huntington Beach, um, et cetera, and let them make decisions for their locality. I know here in Orange County, a lot of the, a lot of the cities are coming together to lobby Governor Newsom um, to allow Orange County to open up. The reason why they're not doing this themselves and just saying, we don't care what the governor says, is the governor has literally threatened Orange County with cutting off of state funds if they go against his recommendation. So the supervisors in the cities have been very hesitant to do anything because they don't want their funds cut off, but they're organizing to try to lobby and negotiate with the governor. So if it were up to me, I would allow local municipalities to make their own decisions based on the 
capacity in their local healthcare systems. As much local governance as possible, as much individual liberty and responsibility as possible as well. Masks, effective, not effective? Not as effective as we're led to believe. So first of all, as I walk around and I see people with these cloth masks on, um, or even regular masks on, if you're not used to wearing a mask, there's a tendency to touch it, to adjust it, to scratch your nose, they're uncomfortable, and immediately as soon as you start doing that, you remove any protective benefit from that mask. I've had asked to me, well, what if I'm sick? Shouldn't I have a mask on? Because won't that prevent the droplet spread of me to infect somebody else? Theoretically, yes, but the problem with that is there's very little evidence that there's this crop dusting occurrence where I'm walking around, I have no symptoms, um, yet I'm spraying virus everybody for other people to get in infected. As a matter of fact, there were some studies done in New York that showed the vast majority, I think it was about 67 to 70% of people that catch this virus do so indoors in their own home, not out in public. And so, um, and so wearing a mask, not only is it uncomfortable, I read an article, I posted it the other day about a guy wearing an N95 mask and crashed his car because it was so uncomfortable and distracting. And I see people out there jogging with a mask on, that makes no sense at all. Riding your bike with a mask on, I don't get it, that doesn't make sense. And the worst is somebody driving solo in their car with a pair of gloves on and a mask, we've, we've entered into crazy town. Dr. Barkey, thank you for talking to us. Really appreciate it. Uh, thank you guys for watching. Please like, share, subscribe, all the good stuff. We will see you at the next one. Take the red pill.